I'm Dave Barnes. I'm an engineer here at HRL Laboratories. Today I'll be talking about correcting distortion of baseband exchange pulses in quantum dot qubits. So before I get into the details of our implementation, I'm first going to mention that other groups have worked on this sort of um, uh, technique before, um, mostly in superconducting groups. They've used uh, some form of um, uh, implementing pre-distortion in uh, qubit control sequences, although recently there has been some more work using quantum dot qubits as well. Um, so before I get into how we can correct for control distortion, it's probably important to understand how we control our qubits. So first, one qubit is encoded into the electron of three or into three electron spins, and we use the exchange interaction, which is we modulate the tunnel barriers between neighboring dots to induce rotations on our qubit. And because we control both the um, electron occupation as well as the nominal tunnel coupling using DC voltages, it requires us to use baseband voltage pulses for qubit control. Um, so one issue with baseband control is that it makes us sensitive to the effects of broadband distortion. Another feature of our qubit systems is that rotations are only in one direction. So we cannot compensate for pulse distortion by using mean zero pulse schemes. And probably most important for us to remember for the rest of this talk is that the finite pulse fall times will lead to a voltage offset with a history dependent magnitude. And because the exchange interaction has an exponential dependence on voltage, we are especially sensitive to this effect. So a Qubit control setup in our lab is probably familiar with most people that have worked in quantum computing labs so far. We have some uh, waveform generators that exist at, you know, followed by filters, and we have cabling, which uh, followed by PC boards and device traces on our qubit chips as well. And this forms our control and signal propagation chain. We can abstract this system as just a simple waveform generator that is or followed by a series of distortion kernels, where the total distortion of the waveforms that reach our qubit is the convolution of each of these sub-elements. And correcting for this as a first step, we can just look at our waveform generator and some room temperature filters, and we can measure distortion using a sampling scope. So at the top of this slide is a um, normalized step response of a programmed AWG step passing through our room temperature filters. Um, and if you zoom in at the top, you can see two notable characteristics right at the start. First is that we have some spiking transients that occur on time scales of around 50 nanoseconds. We also have a single exponential decay following that with a time scale of around 420 nanoseconds. So how do we correct for this distortion? So we're, we're going to use a standard inverse fast Fourier transform correction where we take this step response that I showed on the previous slide, or a fit of it, and perform the time derivative of this step response to create an impulse response. Um, we're going to invert this in the frequency domain. And to create corrected waveforms or pulse trains, we'll, we would apply this inversion or this pulse distortion, pre-distortion kernel to our desired pulse train. And at the output, we should get the waveforms that, we, that we're desiring to send to the qubits. The bottom of this slide is, well, first, in the, bl the blue curve is a fit of the data that I showed on the previous slide of the AWG and filter outputs that are measured, at, or that was measured at the, with a sampling scope. The gray stepped function is the AWG sequence that we're going to program into you know, the AWG to create our desired output or a more ideal step response. And the orange curve is the prediction of what that output will be. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the original step response that we measured at room temperature, followed by a step response that we've programmed into our AWG after applying our room temperature FFT anti-filter. Anti and it's obviously much closer to an ideal step response. So how does this manifest itself when we actually bring this to real qubit control sequences? Well, at the top of this uh, slide, um, you can see the significant improvement that we get in total gate error once we go to idle times that are relatively short. And the idle time is the time in between exchange pulses. Um, there's a cartoon in the bottom right of this slide that's sort of trying to illustrate this effect. Without applying a pre-distortion filter and an anti-filter to our pulse sequences, 
the falling edges of our exchange pulses begin to run into the subsequent pulses, which will build up on top of each other and you'll get start to accumulate more error for shorter idle times. Applying this anti-filter or pre-distortion will eliminate this effect. And like as I said before, the effect is actually pretty significant on error rates for short idle times. Um, so this is the most significant result that we have by correcting for pre-distortion in the context of qubits and qubit control. Um, the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about further improvements we're trying to make on this system. We just haven't yet connected this to real qubit control sequences yet. So as I said, we've obviously demonstrated a pretty good correction for both just the AWGs and some room temperature filterings when we consider qubit control. But there's still a significant part of the signal chain that we're not correcting for. So inside of our fridge, we have, like I said before, cabling, PC boards, and device traces on the qubit chips themselves. And we want to correct for the total distortion of this part of our system. This almost requires that we need to use our qubits as our distortion measurement system. So how can we do this? Well, we can use a technique that we use just for normal qubit control on our, you know, in normal experiments is we're going to use the effects or use a calibration routine in order to extract a cryogenic distortion kernel. So at the top is just a cartoon of a, you know, room temperature corrected pulse sequence that we're it's going, to, going to be distorted by this cryogenic distortion elements. And the voltages that we're going to get at the gate are going to be distorted by this cryo distortion. And the total rotation that the qubit will undergo is going to be that conversion of voltage to energy using this exchange energy J. And to actually calibrate and get an angle to voltage map, it's going to be the rotation, the total rotation that the qubit undergoes divided by the number of pulses that we apply to it. And in the bottom of this slide is a example of a calibration sweep that we performed in the lab. The bottom axis is labeled as arbitrary, but that's because we're stepping actually trying to step linearly in exchange energy, and which means we're actually stepping sort of exponentially in voltage. Um, and to the right of this slide is going to be that sort of unwrapped angle to voltage calibration that would lead to this linear stepping in uh, energy. So how can we use calibration to extract a um, cryo distortion kernel? Well, we're, in principle, we can extract this cryo distortion from two different kinds of measurements. One is where we are going to we could change the calibration versus the evolve time or the actual length of our exchange pulses. The second experiment we can use is where we um, sweep the duration of our idle times or the time in between the exchange pulses that we're going to throw in a pulse train. Both have their advantages. Um, I, I'm probably not going to get into the details of those advantages. They're, you know, read right on this slide. You can pause the video. Um, but you can use both schemes to correct for the limitations of the other method of doing it. Um, yeah, we can use both data sets. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have already our room, known room temperature kernel that we've already corrected for. We're going to combine this with are a unknown uh, distortion kernel, which we parameterize by some, you know, values. Uh, combining this with a J to V mapping for pulse separations that are greater than our distortion, so around 100 nanoseconds, we can extract a, a voltage to exchange energy mapping. We can combine this with single axis calibration measurements. And at the end, we'll perform a joint maximum likelihood estimation on the parameters of our guessed uh, cryogenic distortion kernel. C applying this effect shows you know, good agreements between data and simulation. The, two, the red and blue boxed elements of this slide show the a exchange pulse train for two different idle times. Um, and the red curve is we have our shortest idle time. And you can start to see the effects of this history-dependent buildup on subsequent exchange pulses which is what we're expecting and trying to correct for. So takeaways from this talk would be exchange only qubits are controlled with base pan pulses and energy exchange energy is strictly positive. Uh, standard fast Fourier transform inversion of room temperature pulse distortion improves randomized benchmarking error at short idle times. Um, we can correct for cryogenic distortion, but it requires qubit data and new methods. And um, 
yeah, specifically we're trying to extract it by using calibration data and correcting for room temperature and cryo distortion is a work in progress.